a third of the mornings I wake up, I ask myself, am I still me or am I someone else? I, I ask myself that. Just Damn, I know it's you, a little. You getting deep in the morning, man? That's how you start your mornings? No, I never really needed coffee. That's just oh my that's my God. jump start thought. I start my morning like this. Oh Jesus, I got to do this again. <laughs> this is Star Talk. This is the Halloween show. Chuck, always good to have you there. Co-host, always a pleasure. Uh, stand-up comedian and actor. Acting like a comedian? Acting, yep. Oh, is that what that was? Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, zombies again, but in a more sort of analytic, scientific context. We're going to talk about ghosts. We're going to talk about reanimating putrefied life <laughs> or, or just dead life, right? Mm. If that phrase can ever even be uttered. Such My as Lord. What, by now he stinketh. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Little Lazarus reference there. Oh, is that what that was? Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. The, you know, that's. Well, of I course. Think that, I, I think Jesus made the first zombie, and people don't even realize it. No, he oh doesn't get credit for that. Oh Jesus made the first zombie. Lazarus. Chuck, you, you nailed that one. There yep. it is. There it is. <laughs> and, um, and that was before. He became a zombie himself. Uh, well, there you go. Right. That's he was it. spotted in town after he rose send, from the dead. Send your letters to Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> that <laughs> nice did not call Jesus a zombie. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, so anyhow, I, neither you nor I have any expertise in this field. So we're, right. we're, we have two guests. We're going to start off with one first, uh, David Andrejevich. I think that I pronounced your name right, David. Close enough, close enough. C close Thank enough. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Andreevich. Andreevich. Yes, actually, this was this was spot on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Andreevich. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, you're Associate Research Scientist in Neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine. So wow. you're coming to us from, I presume, New Haven, Connecticut? Yes, yes. Yeah, and you co-authored a recent study, and you managed to restore key cellular functions in the cells of a pig that had been dead for an hour. Wow. Whoa. Okay, Frankenstein pig is what that is. Franken pig. Okay. Franken pig. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. uh, did, did, did it have electrodes and like, you know, a Does Tesla it have, coil and- have bolts in its neck? <laughs> I know, bolts in its neck. And you have to throw no. your arms up and say, it is alive. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, then right afterwards yeah. you go, it's alive! It's not bacon! <laughs> it's not bacon. <laughs> yeah, no, right. I, yeah, I need to dis disappoint you there. Uh, yeah, please straighten us out. I mean, we, our, you know yeah. our imagination was just flying there. So what did you actually do, please? Yeah, so it didn't look uh, as cool as you described, Tal. Uh, it's basically what we've done is we developed this technology that is capable of restoring certain cellular functions one hour after that pigs, as you said. And how we achieved that is basically, um, and actually how, what like what uh, makes this technology uh, possible is two components. So one is a machine perfusion device, which is similar to those uh, heart and lung machines that you uh, hear about in clinics, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. called echo machines or which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that. I knew that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, go on. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's basically like a, a heart and lung machine, right? And then uh, we also have, we also made the synthetic perfusate, which is something uh, sort of a synthetic blood, which we mixed with animals' blood and restore the circulation first in order to achieve uh, this kind of bringing cells uh, healthy again, making cells healthy again, and so on. So, and, so you 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 kind of created some blood, created a blood flow, sent exactly. oxygen to cells, and thereby revived the cells themselves because that's what they need. You kind of fed them, and then they they kind of came back to life. Exactly. That's the key. So the key was to restore the circulation, of course. And we for, for, for that, we needed the machine. And then also we developed this solution that has 
a lot of different components. For example, it has like lots of vitamins, amino acids. It has it's the, the chemistry. A, a, you need good chemistry yes. going on in there. Yes, okay. exactly. Like a drug cocktail, an oxygen carrier, and so on. And however, to, to reach out to those cells uh, to restore their function, uh, basically, uh, we need the machine. So they work together to achieve our goal. Wait a minute, David. Are you saying you did not use bolts of electricity? Come on now. And for, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> okay. well, and the next time, you, next time you do it, just fake the electricity. Fake the electricity. <laughs> just fake it, man, so that we can, because we need that. You we know? need we it. we got to have that. You know? And also, make sure that the roof of wherever you are opens up. <laughs> and that there's there's a table that rises up. <laughs> you gotta have and the this moonlight. Stuff. Yeah, you, yeah, you need the moonlight it. and the, the rising table. I forgot yeah, about that, Chuck. Yeah, you need the rising table. You need the moonlight coming. You need all that. <laughs> and do it at night. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the term we've heard is reanimation. Is that a fair a fair term for this? What you're doing? So I would uh, we did because we focused on the cellular level. So reanimation usually refers to like other other uh, layers uh, layers or levels of, uh, of of function, like a whole organism functioning. So since we focus just on the cellular level, we 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 wrote it like that. So we said we mentioned oh we're restoring certain cellular functions and so on. So we wanted to keep it conservative because I know that we knew that everybody would think about zombie pigs immediately. So <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. So, so this brings the question, uh, uh, an hour is sort of a nice convenient amount of time rather than just one minute or five minutes. You know, right. we all know people have been dead or it's hearts stopped for that time and you, you zap them back to life. So how much thought went into it being an hour as opposed to three hours, six hours? 12 mm -hmm. hours a day. Oof. Yeah, what what yeah. what sets your limits there? And what is the level of cellular degradation at an hour that yeah. so, allows that 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 says, "Oh, we did something." Yeah. So that's those are both go, uh, good questions. I mean, like 1 hour just sounds sounds as you mentioned, it's it's really has a lot of implications if we can achieve it at, at that 1 hour. And also what we have uh, discovered before in our lab and also with this study confirmed is that like when cells uh, are die, it's not like an instantaneous event. It's like a more protracted series of events. And because of that, there's this like time window in which we can intervene, uh, stop that process and restore the cellular function. Not to put a word in your mouth, but what you're saying is that the act of dying and death is itself a continuum. Yes, it's on the cellular level. Definitely, it is. Uh, wow. It's that's, from my perspective. Yes, but see, that's that's amazing because it's amazing because we we we, yeah. have, we think in binary terms: you're either alive or you're dead. Or dead, right? right? You're not uh, one third alive and two thirds dead. <laughs> yeah. So this could change the vocabulary. This could change people's awareness of what I'm all this on is the about. death spectrum. <laughs> on the death spectrum, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so so what this tells me is what you hinted at is different parts of the cell may die at different sooner than other parts, and so the cocktail you feed it, uh, mm -hmm. plus the electricity just for show, the cocktail you feed it um, will have to know you have to know what part of the cell needs reinvigorating at what time after death, and that mm. would presumably change as the minutes go by. Yes, yes. So also like uh, now science knows there's just not one way for cell to die. There are so many different uh, uh, processes that can happen and cells can die in different ways. So basically what we have tried to achieve besides of course restoring this like environment for the cell uh, to be healthy again and to restore its function, uh, we also uh, wanted to inhibit or stop these different processes. And that's what we targeted with our uh, drug cocktail. So what, what are the, I mean, I'm just trying to think of practical applications. Mm -hmm. it, when this, let's say, is fully developed, is this something where I kind of don't have oxygen going to my brain for a long time, and instead of being brain dead, you're able to help me not be that? Or... Yeah, I guess what are, what are the limits of this? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we see so, where it's starting. Where can you take it? 
So I think like, well, brain is most susceptible to ischemia, to, to, to loss of blood flow. And, and it's being notorious for that. Uh, however, Just some that word other, you used? I like that word, scheme, schemia? Uh, ischemia. It's ischemia. like, a, a, yeah, loss of blood flow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a word. And, Good. Uh, and uh, so what, what happens, like we're at the moment not sure how it will reflect all the other organs and like what the future will, will bring us. But we hope that at least we can restore uh, these vital organs such as kidney, liver, heart, lungs, pancreas, even that we have tested uh, in our in our study, and that we can by doing so increase organ donor pool and use these organs for transplant. Oh wow! So mm, for wow, for, like to go that far and and talk about brain recovery and, and so on, we're kind of not. We're not sure to which extent brain can recover still because it's extremely susceptible to ischemia, gotcha. but maybe some other organs might work. So wow. we just so, hope that this will increase the organ or pool. Well, basically. no, you could end up saving so many lives because you're extending the life of an organ. So right. that exactly. gives it that gives it more time to reach the the person who needs it. Exactly. Right, but wow. but I have a, a question though, if if um. I can get what you're saying with regard to the cell, mm -hmm. but an organ is a collection of countless cells all acting in some harmonious way. Mm. And that's not what you're, you're not bringing the organ back to life, you're bringing a, a cell back to life. How, does, how do you bring the organ itself back to life? Or do all the cells say, hey, let's just pick up where we left off? <laughs> enter, well, yeah. enter the electricity in the bolts. <laughs> we'll get there, Chuck. We're trying maybe, to get there. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was the ingredient that we needed there. Uh -huh. <laughs> because we want so uh, a cell. Rec so this was all like uh, like more of a proof of concept study. So we wanted to show whether we can even do that or not after one hour. So and of course we were we weren't even expecting this to happen. So yet alone seeing the whole organ functioning again. But uh, in order to whole organ function again, we we at least we need a cell function again, then maybe a tissue function, and then uh, a whole organ function where all the cells are communicating together, doing their functions like a concert, and so on. So maybe eventually we'll come to that point. Gotcha. All right. You're using a machine to to tell the cell what to do. So then, why couldn't you extend it? to kind of let the machine kind of be like an endocrine, you know, uh, traffic cop and tell the whole organ what to do? Well, that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> well, basically, we we kind of uh, limited ourselves to, to six hours uh, because that was, uh, we had some experience from our, some previous work in our lab and also wanted to see whether like, it's more, it was more of a yes or no question at that point. So whether uh -huh. we can see that or not. And then now when we know, okay, we can see that, okay, now it's actually uh, a next uh, next step. So for example, exactly this, uh, we are trying to do two things at once. Uh, we are trying to do two things at once in the future. One is of course, to maybe prolong this perfusion time, maybe to like 24 hours or even longer. And then the other aspect would definitely be uh, to even transplant these organs to other animals and then see whether, like to which extent this organ has recovered in its function. Wow. Now your background is in neuroscience, uh, but this feels, not to put divide, dividing lines everywhere, but this feels more like sort of cell biology. So where does your neuroscience training uh, help feed what's going on here. So that's a <laughs> that's a question of all the questions. Well, uh, I was fortunate enough, so I went to med school before, and then I joined the lab uh, 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 as a neuroscientist. And then this whole technology started in a brain before, and then uh, so this lab actually our lab. Uh, 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 published a study back in 2019 showing that it can restore certain cellular functions in the brain after after prolonged ischemia or lost blood flow. 
And then after that, uh, everybody was just uh, excited about the findings. And uh, my, my so Dr. Shes and my boss phone couldn't uh, stop ringing because everyone from a different perspective would call him and, and would ask him like, oh, have you tried this on the liver? Have you tried this on the heart or on the kidney and so on? So what he decided to do is uh, he decided to do like a shotgun approach. Like, let's see whether this can work on every organ at once. And so I was fortunate enough to be at that. Uh, that was the time when I joined the lab and because of my background and also in medicine. So he, uh, he told that I would be a good person to lead this project. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and so is there, a, is there an ethical component of what you're doing where you bring in maybe a bioethicist to, to look over your shoulder and advise on where this is or can go? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. So the whole study was being uh, uh, like overseen by two committees. So one was, of course, Yale's Institutional Animal Care News Committee. And also we had an external advisory committee to help us plan uh, the experiments, to help us uh, like, the, the, like develop the anesthesia protocol so, people, so animals would not uh, be in distress and so on. And also to use the the least number of animals possible for this study. And of yeah. course, uh, we uh, in our in our one of the authors of our manuscript is a bioethicist, Stephen Layton from from Yale as well. Okay, yeah, so so we yeah. got we got you covered on that end. That's good. Yes, because yes, you yes. know, uh, because I'm I'm pretty sure you can tell us during the break, which we're gonna have to take in just a minute, uh, how many zombies you stored in the basement. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> Just you can save that for the break. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I got one last question here. Is there any sort of key chemical ingredient that seems to be the most important, or is it's such a cocktail that it's really the full mixture of them? Yeah, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we would also like to know the answers to that question, uh, so we can we can you know uh, sell it on the market. I, I know, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, it's 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 the it's the it's everything all together uh, that we think it's what makes the difference. So mm. okay. it's also for, for us, we have, we have constantly asking uh, ourselves a question like, can we somehow estimate which drug is doing, you know, percentage wise, exactly. you know, if this drug is like 50, yes. this 20, but yes. that is just impossible. There's so many different compounds. And also when we're doing experiments, we're doing one experiment per day. And so it will literally take us a, like years and years to uh, to even evaluate to, to control all the variables, right? Yes, right, exactly. So you're just like it's it's too complex, too many variables. Wow. So a after the experiment, um, did the pig have a taste for brains? <laughs> <laughs> Frankenstein didn't eat brains, did he? No, no, no. no. <laughs> but I'll tell you this: just since we are Halloween here, uh, uh, pigs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in a full-grown sort of hog has organs approximately the size of that of humans, right? So they make very good sort of human substitutes in these kinds of studies. You would do yes. this for a pig rather than a mouse because for, for just that reason. Is that is that correct? Yes, absolutely. There's the, there's the reason why. So David, thanks for this bit of insight and, a, and some exposure to your work here. We will monitor that space and maybe bring you back when you actually finally do come to your senses and use electrodes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so we learned you can restore and reanimate individual cells and possibly even whole organs. But what about restoring your consciousness? Mm -hmm. What is consciousness? Mm. Is it something that can be restored? And what, what's the latest on that? Mm. What a mystery consciousness has always been and may continue to be. When we come back, Consciousness expert George Mushur after the break. We're back. Star Talk, the Halloween edition. I got Chuck Nice with me, Chuck. Hey. All right. So we learned about reanimating cell functions after yeah. they've been dead for an hour and even organs that the cells comprise. Fascinating. And what about sort of reanimating consciousness? Well, we can take that to its most basic level because, Chuck, when you go under anesthesia, Mm -hmm. Are you conscious, right? And then when Neil, anesthesia wears off, then you sort of wake. You're not asleep, Neil, right? Yeah, I am not conscious right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, 
We'll get in line and talk to our expert about that one. We've got George Mouchoir. George is the Robert Sweet Professor and Chair of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan Medical School. Ooh. And wait a minute. This man is also the director of the Michigan Psychedelic Center. Ooh, we know which uh, decade sound, he went to college in. Okay. Sounds like a guy I want to be friends with. We know when this, <laughs> this man went to school. Uh, and founder of the Center for Consciousness Science. I love it. What a frontier consciousness is on every level. Yeah. So, George, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so, so tell me, what is, what is a clinical definition of consciousness versus unconsciousness just 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 so we're on the same page here yeah that's such a great question it's actually a really big question because consciousness by definition is subjective and yet all of our determinations about consciousness and other people and other species uh, relates to behavior and we make inferences based on our responsiveness um, and in the clinical setting, really, it, it's about following commands. It's about responsiveness. It's about interactivity. And most of the time that works, sometimes we can be led astray by making inferences that somebody who's unresponsive is actually unconscious. So, so are you, that sounds more like awareness because like you say you're unconscious when you sleep, but you're dreaming, your heart is beating, you're, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. the brain is still lit. The brain in is a, still a, lit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so during general anesthesia, there's actually a lot of brain function that is preserved. I mean, you're still controlling a lot of autonomic functions. There's still uh, activity going on in your primary sensory cortices, connectivity, representation. Anesthesia is probably more about the higher order integration uh, that brings together all of this processing to create that emergent property of subjectivity that we're experiencing right now. So how, do, how does this connect to, uh, we read about in their movies that try to talk about near-death experiences, where if I can recount what people say they are, they're sort of clinically dead in some way, their heart mm. stopped. And I don't know that this always includes being brain dead, but certainly the heart has stopped and then they're brought back. And then they give a whole story of where they went, where they visited, what light in the sky they was a looked big at. white light. It was right. huge. It was so bright, but yet it did not hurt my eyes. Oh, and, and it and, called and, and to yet me. they're on an operating table where there are lights above them. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's going on during what we think of as NDEs? Yeah, great question. And... It's a great example of where somebody who is behaviorally quiescent, they're not doing anything, is actually having this really rich, vivid phenomenology that can transform their lives. And actually, it, uh, it's interesting. It gets back to that question of the electricity uh, that you were discussing with your, your previous guest, because what has been identified in dying humans and also in some very well-controlled animal studies is that around the time of death, there's actually a surge of electrical activity that goes on the brain. This surge can actually be coherent and well-organized, and it's being explored as a neurobiological basis for the near-death experience. Wow. Is this also, my whole life unfolded in front of me? Right yeah. Before I, that kind of thing, is that? Yes, I mean, it's... Um, you know, there's still a, a big bridge uh, to be crossed between that neurobiology and some of the phenomenology that you're referring to. And th these are uh, really characteristic descriptions that go back to antiquity, seeing the tunnel, the light, mm -hmm. the life recall. Mm -hmm. um, so lots to do in terms of bridging that gap. But I think uh, what has occurred in the past decade or so uh, is... Uh, a progress in terms of understanding that there can be a neurobiology to this. There can be neural correlates of consciousness around the time of death. So that takes it out of the metaphysical or supernatural realm into the neuroscientific realm. Is it possible because our brains are just liars? I mean, anybody who, I mean, whatever you think you saw, you most likely didn't. And we're really malleable and, and very easily influenced. Is it possible that 
people have these very similar experiences because they've heard that people have these very similar experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's a great question. You know, whether or not this um, kind of folk psychology or common mythology around death yeah, collective gets delusions. transmitted yeah, and, yeah, and people yeah. report that. But actually, this is, this is where the, the science uh, is, is quite helpful. And when I, with my colleague, Jimo Borshigan here at the University of Michigan, published an article almost 10 years ago in animals showing that there were neural correlates of consciousness after experimentally induced cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. There are a lot of people who had near-death experiences who reached out to thank us uh, because they felt like that neurobiology actually helped validate their experience. So is it possible that there is some psychological influence? It is. Uh, but I do think that there is an emerging consensus that there there might be some clear neurobiology that's going on around the time of death. Wow! Because we're all we're all the same species, so you'd expect some common reaction to common causes. Is that that's where you're going there, right? Right, and it occurs across species too. So we're wow. seeing very similar findings in rodents that we are in humans in terms of that surge of high frequency activity. So can you set a time limit to how long a brain can be, quote, brain dead before it gets reanimated so that you could, you know, tell us that the Frankenstein brain, Abbey normal in the jar <laughs> off the shelf in formaldehyde, that is it just that we don't know how to reanimate it? Or can you say it can never be reanimated based on everything we know about physiology? So first of all, I want to make a distinction between what some people refer to as clinically dead, which is primarily from the cardiovascular perspective. So mm -hmm. the heart is stopped with brain death, which is a cessation of all brain function, both cortical and subcortical brainstem activity. Wow. So I think what we're talking about in the context of the near-death experience um, is that cardiovascular death where you do have residual activity. Um, again, uh, it's a spectrum and it's a process. Uh, so it's it's not clear to me what the, the timing is. This is extremely difficult to study. We see the surge of activity in animals at around 30 seconds uh, after cardiac arrest. And afterwards, you do get that uh, quiescence of, of brain activity. Uh, but this is happening on, on both sides of the divide, if you will. It's happening across the spectrum. So in these critical care patients, you're seeing the spikes of activity prior to death. And there are other examples, for example, uh, terminal lucidity, which is where Alzheimer's patients, for example, um, who have been non-communicative for years suddenly start to become lucid. They start to interact right before their death. So we think that there's a spectrum of that brain activation that's going on, but but the, the temporal window has yet to be defined. But wait a minute. If you know that happens, that in principle is reproducible. Whatever yes. is going on to... Right. to, uh, to to reanimate the al the severe Alzheimer's patient, mm -hmm. you this is we're talking about science here, right? So whatever that is, you duplicate it, and then put it in a pill, and then let everybody right. take it. Right. Absolutely. And and I worked with a group uh, from the National Institute of Health to make that claim that these examples of terminal lucidity really represent an opportunity to understand that neurobiology. That it's not just structural degeneration, there's some functional component. And if we can bottle that, if you will, understand it, reproduce it, it could be a pathway toward reanimating cognition uh, and communication. That's amazing. By the way, uh, Alzheimer's, terrible, terrible disease. Grandfather died of it. And uh, uh, what it taught me is that every single thing that you do, uh, your brain is, how can I put it? conscious that you are doing it. When you swallow, you think it's involuntary. Your brain doesn't think that's involuntary. Your brain is actually saying swallow. And it's crazy when you watch somebody lose every single bodily function uh, because- In, it, in it, sequence. It, in a, some it's kind sequence, of, yeah. thank you, right, yes. Right, right. Yeah, one by it's one. crazy, it's crazy. Right, 
right, right. So George, let's let's get back to consciousness for the moment. Now that you've basically admitted that combined with our first segment, we can make conscious zombies. That's really what you just said. I'm pretty sure. Um, but what what is there agreement on what consciousness is? I guess people can define it, but the fact that books are continually written about it tells me we know very little. Because once you understand scientifically a subject, you don't have to keep writing books on it to say consciousness explained or new discoveries. So I, I, th I think to myself that consciousness studies is still kind of in its infancy because of this. Am I wrong? And, and that's it, why you're conscious, because you think, therefore you are. Thank you, Chuck, for, for that. Okay. <laughs> you are uh, you are correct, Neil. This this actually is a fairly young science, and even if you know you think back historically, consciousness as a subject of scientific study was really delegitimized for most of the 20th century. So it's it's the 1990s, the mid 1990s, when this formal study of consciousness started to emerge, and decades later, we're still asking fundamental questions. For example. Are the neural correlates of consciousness in the front of the brain or in the back of the brain? And, and this is, that's coming up in titles in neuroscientific journals. I'm not exaggerating the coarseness of that. So for as much as we've learned about how to manipulate neural circuitry uh, over the past decades, there's still some really fundamental questions in terms of where consciousness is happening or processed in the brain. An issue I have is uh, in physics, you know, quantum physics is a, is a fundamental branch of the field. Uh, but there are mysterious things that happen that we can describe with high accuracy, but we don't really understand what the hell is happening. You know, particles disappear and reappear, and we can describe it. We know what they're doing mathematically, but can you say, do you understand it? Nope, that's just how nature behaves. What concerns me is I see people trying to apply the mysteries of quantum physics to the mysteries of consciousness as though taking our ignorance in one place somehow helps the ignorance in the other, rather than making it just doubly ignorant. Mm, works That's for my me. opinion there. Yeah, no, <laughs> really interesting, Neil. And, uh, you know, since it's a Halloween theme, we can talk about spooky action at a distance, because one of the, one of the theories within that quantum realm is that uh, the, the kind of integration that needs to go on for conscious experience to happen is mediated by... Uh, quantum process or quantum entanglement. Um, and the, the argument has been, as, as you just very well described, that just because one thing has a, a similar kind of mysterious quality as another doesn't mean uh, that they should be connected. Now, we've actually studied uh, this in the context of anesthesia because some people have posited that anesthetics work by disrupting this quantum interaction. Uh, and we could talk about it if you want, but the long and short of it is we uh, applied um, general anesthetics, liquid ether, to uh, photons, both classical and entangled. And I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm not going to pretend like I am. But people are st starting to uh, address this empirically so we can either move forward or, or just leave that discourse behind. Now, I know that Roger Penrose is a very famous decorated uh, physicist, astrophysicist, has stepped into the consciousness realm. But let me remind people, by, by invoking quantum uh, causes for so much of what's described, but allow me to say in this moment that his Nobel Prize, granted just a couple of years ago, was for black holes, not for consciousness. Or, yes. So just to be clear, all right, yes, what's going yes. on there? Yes, and he, he was part of that wave in the 1990s, and his, his work, you know, uh, really stimulated that line of thinking. Yeah, and I think we shouldn't ignore it, but just I, I don't like explaining things with things I don't yet understand. That that's right. that's yeah. that never sat well with me. You have to Chuck. approach it empirically. Yeah, exactly. Chuck. What? So if you're looking for you know whether uh, you know you're looking at the a, a place in the brain that houses consciousness, we know that the brain itself does house consciousness, and. Uh, whether it's just these electrical, you know, impulses that are firing all the time, and when that electricity is plug is pulled, we're gone, or something else, could you take it and put it someplace else if you were to find it and locate it? 
That sounds like something for the next segment, Chuck. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what you're talking about uploading your consciousness. That the people, I, I, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what you just said there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The, I'm, that, I'm, big question, right? Is there something special about this neurobiological substrate? Or is this just about functional relationships of so electrochemical activity that could be reproduced in a non-biological context? And we're going to get to that in the next segment. Let's take a break now. <laughs> and when we return on our Halloween edition, we're talking about reanimating cells, reanimating consciousness, um, zombies, Frankenstein, and uh, we're going to have to throw in ghosts somehow in this third segment just to, just to round out the Halloween experience. You're <laughs> watching, possibly listening to Star Talk. We'll be right back. We're back on Star Talk, our third and final segment of our Halloween edition. We're talking about reanimating dead cells that's mm. actually been done and accomplished in a lab in New Haven and at Yale. And we're talking about uh, consciousness, its existence, its absence, reanimating it uh, with an anesthesiologist. So first, uh, David Andrejevich, thanks for coming back to the show for this third and final segment. And we've got George Mushur. Uh, who is, George, let me uh, correct me if I'm wrong with your full title here, a chair of anesthesiology, University of Michigan Medical School, and founding director of the Michigan Psychedelic Center. We didn't even touch that subject yet, perhaps. But let's, let's pick up where we left off. Uh, there was a question, Chuck, what was, your, what was that question where you left us? Oh, oh, I was just saying, if you can locate it, can you take it and place it someplace else? Your consciousness. Put, put, put your consciousness somewhere other than yourself. I love that question. So, George, what do you have there? I don't have anything. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, Very you know, good. I, again, the best answer ever. <laughs> yeah, best answer. That, that's about as <laughs> honest as you can get. I, I, I have to be honest because, you know, really it's a foundational question as to whether or not consciousness is purely neurobiological or is, is it functional? And, and functionalism is a you know, one approach to thinking about consciousness, which is this is about the characteristics of a system, not necessarily a set of neural systems. But I think that, you know, the, the first approach is we have to understand it better in humans who can report their conscious experience before we start thinking about how it gets reproduced elsewhere. Of course, because if you don't, if you can't, if you don't really understand it in humans to then say, let's upload it somewhere, that doesn't mean make any sense. Right. But I, I will add, I, did you not, uh, George, did you not in different words speak of what evolutionary biologists call emergence in evolution, where you can study a bird down to the cellular level and you will never know that birds together will flock that information is not contained in the cellular biology of the bird. It's only a collective emergent phenomenon. So that if you can't identify consciousness as in the behavior of cells, could it be emergent in the ensemble of the behavior of cells that comprise the entire brain? Ooh. Yeah, Neil, that, I mean, that's my inclination and that's uh, my perspective. Not everybody shares it, but I do think this is more of a network level dynamic and a network level emergence of subjective experience. And I think that speaks directly to the question of reanimation, regeneration, if, you, if you're, and, and we think about it even in the operating room, we're wow. reanimating from the anesthetized state. That, you know, that is a process of, of reconnection and reemergence. In fact, yeah. we call it emergence from anesthesia. You do, okay. So, yeah. But if the sum of the parts is greater than or even different than the individual parts, how, how do you how do you find it? How do, like what what are you able to do? Maybe uh, that very to, question is wrong, right? Like how do you find the flock the flocking in a bird? You can't, right? right? Maybe the very question is flawed, right? Just, yeah, just 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 saying. I mean, we try to ex approach that experimentally by various measures of integration in brain function, uh, such as connectivity um, and, and how the electrical activities relate to one another to, to try to grasp that. We, we do dynamic analyses, but yes, it, it is, uh, it's a difficult question, but I would agree that 
consciousness is not going to be found at an individual cellular level. It's going to be at a systems level. So I got a question connecting back to George here, because when you anesthetize someone, they can no longer feel pain. There's a lot of their body that has shut down. Uh, other parts still work. Of course, the heart still beats. So how is it that your anesthesia can do what the suite of things you need it to do, but not shut down George's organs that he would otherwise try to animate that would otherwise be non-functioning? Yes. So, I mean, if you turn the anesthetic high enough, you can shut down the organs. There's no doubt about that. At the concentrations that we use to suppress consciousness, I really do believe it's a kind of uh, disassembly of that emergence uh, process. You're, you're creating inhospitable conditions for the emergence to occur, for the connection, for the communication to occur. So in the brain, you can still have local areas that are functioning in meaningful ways, even representing the environment. And we've tested that empirically, but it's that higher order synthesis that seems to be disrupted. Interesting. And just to clarify yeah. something you mentioned earlier, just to throw a little more physics in the conversation, the, the whole idea of a quantum entanglement, by the way, anything on the level of atoms and molecules and, and the deep chemistry that goes on among them is quantum. The quantum forces are operating all throughout. So quantum entanglement is you have two particles that know about each other's existence from separated by a distance, and then something can happen in one where the other one responds instantaneously to it because they're entangled and instant and not faster than the speed of light. It's an instantaneous uh, in the in the lingo of quantum physics, instantaneous collapse of the wave function because the two particles share the same wave, essentially. And so if consciousness goes beyond just a local spot in the brain and it really surfs quantum phenomenon, then maybe quantum entanglement really matters. And that's not huh? just a frontier. Just wanted the to clarify. The Vulcan that. mind meld. Oh! The Vulcan mind meld. Oh! It can happen. It can happen, people. The Vulcan mind meld is a is a quantum entanglement. Oh my right. gosh! You heard it here, people. There you go, people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so George, can you reanimate a brain? Do you think? Not now. Just at some point. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, like we know. <laughs> yeah, David comes to you and said, the brain dead. They, they right. drag him off the table. And he said, no, I got this. I got this. Put him on my slab. And I, and I got this. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I don't know the answer. But the question really is going to be, you know, what is, re what is reanimated? Are we oh. reanimating cells uh, that are functioning in independent ways? And this gets back to the, the organ uh, recovery right, or a, a are we going challenge. to be able to, right. Yeah. Are we, yeah, absolutely. Are, and I think it's even more pertinent for the brain. Are we going to be reanimating that network level emergent phenomenon, uh, that is manifest to us as consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think those, those answers are going to be distinct. But so, wow. so David, how much of what you do is, I mean, I have to think at some level there's some electrochemical things happening. That's how we we're, we're taught about the brain, right? It's not just chemicals. There's like uh, there's synapses. Uh, you know, why else would electric shock therapy work? You know, right. so uh, is there no electrochemistry going on when you reanimate shell cells, even if it's just the chemistry that you introduce? So, <clears throat> no, unfortunately not <laughs> again. But I would say uh, so. We kind of restored the, the environment of the cells and actually we targeted their functions because they were, they were in that process of dying. But maybe in the future, like if you want to restore the whole function of the, of the whole organ, we might do something like that. Like, for example, in the heart, we have seen also in our study that we, there is a restoration of each heart cells, uh, cell individual called cardiomyocyte actually it, they contract you can see that if you take a piece, uh, tissue of the of the of the heart to look at under the microscope we can see they're they're contracting however in order to heart to function properly you need them to to 
communicate together and actually have that heart chambers contract uh, in like a synchronous way. Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. coherently. Yeah. So similar thing is in the brain. You, you can have a, a single neuron or brain cell firing, but in order to actually, I guess, get to the point of, of consciousness, awareness, and so on, they need to act coherently. There has to be a yes, concert. It needs to be a concert. Exactly. Right, exactly. right, right. So right. this level, I mean, the heart, it's well known. You can uh, uh, electroshock the heart, but for the brain, I, I'm, you're not that quick. Wow. Okay, so, so so other than in the film World War Z, where the zombies somehow could move really fast, if memory yeah. serves, most zombies portrayed are kind of slow moving, and they even are a little bit dim-witted, mm -hmm. and so the implication They're tired, there, man. They've been dead. Death they've been dead. Hard. It's tough. It's hard. Tough. Hey, give them, cut them some slack. <laughs> They're a little tired. <laughs> Don't give them a trigonometry exam. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it says is the restoration of life um, in these movies is possible, but it's a lesser version of what it was before. Always. They got. So what we learn is that in a zombie state, they still function, but in a, in a diminished condition, not only phy physically, but also neurologically. Mm -hmm. So is there some, uh, in your organs and in, in the brain, does it like work fully or can it, can there be, is there a spectrum of how it could perform once you, uh, reanimate them. Let me just start with David. Wow. Could, could it half work? So that's that's a good, like, do we want them to half work? Uh, that's also a question. Uh, because what's the point if, uh, let's right. say we want to, if the goal of our, our study is to recover the organs to be able for transplantation, like, you don't want to make them half work and then, because nobody would like uh, to have that heart or the kidney or the liver, Correct. they're just half working. So, mm -hmm. but maybe maybe this is just like a, a one step. We have this analogy in our lab, like if you break a leg, first you need to, you're not going to run the next day. There's, you know, uh, uh, like a, a, a time period where you need to recover first, start walking again, and then able to run after, after some time. David, mm -hmm. I hate to be the first to tell you, but that saying is not deep. <laughs> <laughs> if you break yeah. your leg, like, you're not going to walk the next day. So I know we we say it like this: if you you crawl before you walk. So uh, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of how we say it. But yeah, no, I, no, I get okay. it. You guys are scientists. Yeah. You're in a lab. Well, <laughs> you got to make things yeah. difficult. You got to make it yeah, difficult. Yeah. I get it. Okay. I get it. All right. So wait, yeah. let me ask this then, because Neil just brought up a super fascinating point uh, when you talk about coming back uh, on a on a spectrum with respect to consciousness. How much of consciousness is agency? If you were to come back, but like halfway, that's, is that you? I mean, like, are you still really you? And how much of being you determines what consciousness is? Ooh, ooh. Because by the way, George, I, a third of the mornings I wake up, I ask myself, am I still me or am I someone else? I, I ask myself that. Just Damn, I know it's you, a little. You getting deep in the morning, man? That's how you start your mornings? No, I never really needed coffee. That's just oh my that's my God. jump start thought. I start my morning like this. Oh Jesus, I got to do this again. <laughs> I wake up and I just say, "Am I still me?" Wow. And so, is there some minimum expression of the brain function where someone can say, "Yeah, I'm still me," right? Wonderful philosophical question, taking it out of the realm of zombies. I mean, we, we try to probe this with inducing reanimation from anesthesia in the experimental setting, where we are stimulating with electricity or we're driving a certain set of neurons and we see behaviors that emerge. And we've asked the question actually in these terms, are these zombie rats now? They're, they're, they look, they look oh. awake, but do they have phenomenology that's associated with that? that wakefulness. Right. Uh, we think about it with the emergence of patients from general anesthesia. What, what's that minimal core cell that is emerging and, and that process of the, the self reconstituting after an anesthetic leads to very similar questions. Is this the same person emerging as, as right. the one that went under? So I think uh, not addressing the, the really big questions, but 
utilizing anesthesia as an experimental model can help get at some of those questions of the emergence of the self and the, the, the pathway or trajectory of that self reconstituting. Wow, that's crazy. Because even if you just were to stop certain parts of the brain from talking to one another, you could dramatically change someone's personality and make them kind of feel like I'm, I'm not really me. I would never do that. You know, by like, the way, I, I would never do that. And we, the, you know, and they're we doing had, it. We interviewed Oliver Sacks a few years back. If you're interested, you can check out our archives. And what we learned in that interview, because he has, he's has, he suffers. If I can use that word, the condition of is it face blindness? He he does not recognize faces, whatever the word is for that. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't use the word suffer because I asked him. Uh, if you could go back and take some magic pill and remove this affliction, would you? And he said, no, he wouldn't, because the fact that he had that affliction is what sent him on this journey to study neuroscience. And he published mm -hmm. books. He's got a feature movie made after him. My question to you is, well, I learned that at one point he looked in the mirror and did not recognize who he was looking at. That's how severe that face, face blindness manifested within him. And so are we to say that something broke in his consciousness? Yes. Well, I mean, this gets uh, back to, um, you know, Chuck's earlier point, which is there's so much that we take for granted that is all wired and encoded and processed. I mean, we just assume that if we see our base, we know it's ours. There's some people who can't recognize that, you know, the hand that's attached to them is theirs, that that body ownership is disrupted. So the conscious experience is there. You seeing the face, the patient seeing their hand. Now we're getting to another level of self. This is me, this is my hand, this is my face. And so there's, a, there's really a spectrum of conscious experience from that foundational just sensation of the world, a sense of self, and then putting all that together. Wow. By the way, if I just want to say, if you smoke enough marijuana, you can look at your hand and it's not yours anymore either. <laughs> Chuck, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Comment. Says the man who runs the psychedelic, the psychedelic institute. <laughs> institute. <laughs> so, so George, I say publicly, and tell me if I'm out of line here, that first the brain barely works well enough to interpret objective reality. So that when people start stirring in chemicals, the the assumption that somehow they have a deeper understanding of reality, from my from where I stand, cannot possibly be true. It might be some different reality, but not an objective reality. So the psychedelics that you pre presumably study as founding director of the psychedelic institute, uh, what would you say is the long term goal of that? Because it can't possibly be, let me ask the person on LSD what's really happening here, and that will advance my sci the scientific frontier. Mm. Yeah, so I, I look at psychedelics in the same way that I look at anesthetics. They're, they're tools to manipulate consciousness, allow us to study the brain and study perception. Anesthetics help us modulate the level of consciousness. Psychedelics help us ma modulate the content of consciousness. By the way, and, I don't know if you knew this, but alcohol also influences your state of consciousness. Just in case you didn't know that, I thought I'd put that in your in your list. Absolutely, that goes <laughs> that's uh, goes along with the anesthetic. Okay. actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> acting yeah. on very similar systems. So mm -hmm. I think these are tools. Um, you know, I I don't uh, romanticize or stigmatize research with psychedelic drugs. Uh, we need to be rigorous. We need to be responsible. For me, it's really about understanding the brain, not um, you know using this as a tool to understand uh, reality. Now, some would argue that your your phrase "objective reality" uh, isn't meaningful because it's the brain that's that's generating that this reality. Those the, would the, be the philosophers that. who don't actually do science. So uh, those those concerns do not. Ah! 
Well, I mean, me. but you're talking about what's external. Uh, your objectivity. Correct. Correct. Your, that's your, why your we have machines. Is, is that's, external. Excuse me. No, that's why we have machines to make the freaking measurement. Okay. Then we I'm all gather around the machine and say, "Do you all agree what this machine says?" And we say, "Yes." And it didn't depend on whether you had coffee or whether someone else. Uh, okay. With how agree. awake you were. But, but, but and all the I'm more saying you is do this, off, the closer ahead. you are to an objective reality. To the point where it repeats often enough, you move on to the next problem. However, so. that is always external. Okay, the measurement, the only way the measurement can be made is because it is external. Okay, the only way it can be observed, there are some realities that are not measurable. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so we got to land this plane here. Oh no, this so, is too much so, fun. George, again, you you are with the University of Michigan. David, you're with Yale University. Great to, uh, I, I have an academic soul, so I, I love uh, reaching out to the resources that reside within the nation's universities. So thanks for being on Star Talk. Thank and you. Chuck, always good to have you, man. Always a pleasure. This was fun. All right, this has been Star Talk. This is a Halloween edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up.